<laughs> okay, so here we are on a tiny cord desktop. Uh, this is a live USB key booted into an old compact Presario I have. A uh, very light system, uh, single core Athlon 64 processor, and uh, initially I had one gig of RAM when I installed Tiny Core, but uh, now I have it boosted to a solid four gigs of RAM. So that uh, this this isn't quite as serious as it was when I first installed this, but uh, Tiny Core does run pretty powerfully on this system still. Uh, like I said, I'm just using a live USB key because I wanted to show off the FLWM. Window Manager. This is the standard window manager for Tiny Core. Uh, if you choose the Core Plus installation option or version that has all the extras, you can choose to boot into a, a fancier window manager if you like. But this is just a core package. This is the one that fits into 16 gigs or 16 megabytes rather. Jesus, 60 megabytes of RAM. And the GUI itself, I think, fits into four because it's only four megabytes bigger than the core CLI installation. Um, so, yeah, here we are. Uh, core does pick up your persistence file, so it's picked up uh, some of the programs from my other installation um, just by putting the USB key in. Very interesting concept. And so I inadvertently put a TC install in uh, but if you, from a la another take, but if you install from the core version, uh, the core, not the core plus, but the tiny core, uh, the GUI version, then you're not going to have the TC install. So I'm going to quick walk that through so you can follow along if you need to follow along while you're watching and, uh, just kind of walk quick through. And I'm going to go over the video or the video, the, the apps program again uh, in a little bit. Uh, I always choose the TC install GUI. I don't know if there's a difference. Honestly, I think one might just have the net installer. This one's a little bit newer. I don't know. I always just go for the GUI one and it works great. So we're going to just, uh, I would say go to uh, download and install or download and load and not on boot like I did like an idiot and I don't need that on boot every time. But yeah, so we're going we're gonna to close this up in a sec. I am overdubbing this because the other takes are wild and I actually recorded this natively on Sheen. So uh, that also explains the like 15 frames per second. The, the mouse is actually a lot smoother in my in my world here, everything's a lot smoother, but uh, here we are in the tiny core uh, installation window. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple, very, very um, minimalist. Uh, and so the first thing you want to do is choose your path to core. It's, it, that's going to be in your on your, uh, your boot medium. So that's going to be, for me, mounted in MNT. Uh, and that should probably be mounted in MNT in most people's systems. So I think that the CD-ROM mounts there as well. Uh, I am in SDB. So check it out. Boot. And that's going to be your .gz file, your core file. Um, and that is going to change depending on if you're using the 32-bit version, the Pure 64 version, which I have here. Uh, and then also... The, uh, the there's an ARM version. That's really, I think, the most, probably the one that people are going to want to get the most use out of. Nobody has old computers like this lying around anymore. And it's not really practical to even use them anymore because, I mean, the and you can, I, for the amount of work I put into this computer, I could have already bought a Raspberry Pi. I, I should have. I should have bought a Raspberry Pi because it takes a lot less power. I mean, this thing takes a whole, a whole couple hundred watt power supply just to run a single processor. It's crazy. Um, but it is, I'm a hobbyist, and that's the thing, the other element of Tiny Core. So you just want to choose your Core Pure 64 here. Uh, there is an, a net download uh, that I actually never really played with, but I, I, you know, took the shot and actually just clicked on it when I was doing this take. And so here we are, uh, again. and you can just click that, and it'll, it'll actually uh, pull the latest 64 32-bit core. Um, at, very interesting. I've never uh, tried it, but available. That's nice. So I'm going to throw in the GZ from the boot folder again, just to show y'all. Has something in place there. 
then we're going to go over some of these options. So these are the three options, frugal, USB hard drive, uh, and the USB zip option. Um, frugal is uh, something that's going to stick in your drive. So frugal is something that's going to, it's going to be a hard drive install. Um, yeah, and there's a couple of different options for that. You can wipe a whole disk and just, just have Tiny Core in your system. If you already have Linux installed on this computer, you can do a nested install, which is what I prefer and what I use uh, on my machine because I already have Lubuntu on here and I didn't want to get rid of it. I can just basically install a folder on, on my, my bootable partition or, or, or set another partition as bootable and uh, put the folder in there, point a grub at it, and then he's got a new, a new grub menu option boots right in it's it's pretty it's pretty nice uh you don't need to install a new bootloader or anything uh you don't need to partition or you don't need to um format your drive at all it's very convenient um you, you can do a whole disk install but really that doesn't seem super the only advantage to me that seems like it might be there is it might be a little bit faster to boot uh depending on what kind of hardware you have it might not be faster Honestly, if you're using like a very old 32 RPM, you know, spinning disc, it may not be so great. Um, but yeah, so, you know, if you wanted to do uh, the existing partition install, you can make any of your partitions bootable, uh, not install the bootloader, uh, and, you know, not partition your drive. Uh, you can do the whole disc. You can also, you know, you can... You can take any of your partitions. You can put it on its own partition if you want to. Uh, and you know this this is a big commitment. You know uh, to put to, to go with the go ahead with the frugal install. Um, really, the the easiest way to do it is go for the USB hard drive install. Uh, if you want a walk-in persistence, so this is like more like if you want like you know the Debian style uh, Ubuntu style walk-in persistence. Everything's on one USB drive, and you can take it to any computer you want. Uh, boot it up, and you're gonna have, uh, you know, your your own custom system for yourself, uh, and that's a nice little option. The other option over here is the uh, USB zip option. Um, and USB zip is a bit of an older concept. Uh, it's for people who are booting from DVDs and CDs. So if you have a DVD or a CD and you're booting, but you want to carry persistence with you, you can actually attach your persistence to a second USB key. Uh, so that's a, a nice option here. Uh, it's, it's an older option. Most people are not going to need it because most computers are going to boot from a USB key if they're made within the last 20 years. Uh, but uh, things that are, are still working from a USB 1 and some of the earlier USB 2 revisions may not have the ability to boot from USB drives, uh, and that can be a problem. So for people with that necessity, you can still store your information to a USB drive and have a walking operating system. Uh, the other the other option, there's a fourth option really, and that is that you can just use your live USB key, uh, and in the end, when you ask to shut down, you can choose to save your persistence to a folder on your existing computer. So you can just save uh, your persistence to the system. It's not a walking system anymore because now it's only on your main computer, but that you, all you have to do is pop your USB key in and it'll do like it did here. And you know, like it'll, it'll, it'll uh, automatically load the programs that you, you've asked it to load. Um, and so that can be fun and that can be convenient. Um, so, uh, for the sake of just walking through a little bit, I'm gonna, you know, choose an existing partition, and let's say I did, you know, I wanted to just put up my existing boot partition, and I wouldn't do anything, I wouldn't install bootloader or anything. Um, now these are the formatting options. If again, if I'm doing the nested install, uh, no formatting, don't need to format a damn thing, and it'll just uh, put that folder in on the whatever whatever partition you've asked it to put it in. Um, if you are choosing to install either to a USB key or if you are installing it to uh, your system, uh, you know, if you're installing it to, to a hard drive in a frugal sense and you want to wipe something out, then you're going to have to format it. Uh, I recommend X2 
two for USB keys. So if it's a non-journaling system, so it's going to give it a better lasting life on your USB key. Uh, and then X3 or X4, I always use X4 uh, if you're going directly to the hard drive. Um, and then VFAT if you have to have some kind of compatibility with uh, maybe an older BIOS or if you need compatibility with, uh, yeah, some kind of Microsoft based uh, DOS based system, uh, you may need VFAT. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm just kind of clicking through here to show some options. This is the boot options page. And this really, I mean, you know, you probably won't need many of these. Uh, I, I think that it kind of presets up your TCE. Uh, you know, you, it's like if you want to customize where you put your hard drive or what your hard drive names are, uh, where you restore from. Um, there are some varying options. You can set your VGA code here. You can set the, you can, yeah, you can choose to boot to a uh, text mode, which is uh, a command line. Uh, and then you can choose to start X at your leisure. Um, you can choose to go boot automatically to X setup every time. And that can be beneficial if you're, if you're like, you know, switching computers around and you wanna, um, you know, you need to reset up your, your XVESA system. Uh, I mean, actually, I don't even think that XVESA comes with the Pure 64 version. I think that they're, if I remember correctly, I was only able to either install X or Wayland. Um, and maybe there was another option that I don't, I don't know. There's some kind of other alternative to XVESA, but I, 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 I didn't see it. So I, I'm not as familiar with that. I mean, I'm not really that hardcore that I'm not even I have skewed X at all. Um, or, you know, XORG. Uh, and then <clears throat> this is, this is, uh, you know, just, just a little cheat sheet for your VGA codes if you need to put your VGA codes in. And you can yeah, add as many of these as you want into this uh, space down here on the bottom. And that will just, you know, separate by commas and then it'll, it'll put them into a grub. You don't need to do that if you're doing it in install from with the frugal install because you're going to have to make your own grub, custom grub anyway. So don't worry about that. That's only for people who are actually installing uh, the system to their computer and they need to make their own bootloader. Um, for all intent and purposes, uh, yeah, so the CDE file that we're going through here real fast, that is... Um, where all your programs are going to be. So this is where your GUI is, and that's where all your extended programs are going to be. Uh, otherwise, you can just do a uh, text-based install, like the core only text-based install from here. But if you want to have access to Wi-Fi drivers or you want to have the GUI installed already, that's where you're going to want to do it. Make sure everything is good here. Make sure everything looks right. Uh, make sure you're targeting the right drives to make sure you're not, you know, going to overwrite anything you want and then you click proceed and then it'll walk you through. It will give you some errors if it runs into problems and you can troubleshoot from there. Again, there's really good documentation on the tiny core site. There's a book and everything. Uh, some people like to learn through video. So why not do a little bit more video about it? Why not? Why not? So here's the applications program. Uh, this is where we're going we're to install all of our programs. This is, you know, a GNOME software type deal. But the way that we install programs in TinyCore is a little bit different because the goal of TinyCore is to minimize the amount of RAM used on every single boot. It's, it's just very necessary. If we're going to put the whole operating system into memory and we want this to work on very low memory devices, you're going to want to have a very pared down system every time you boot. What TinyCore gives you the opportunity to do is to have many programs available to you, which you only choose to install or put into load into RAM uh, when you want to use them so that you are not putting too much of demand on your system because we're going to have to also use all of our available RAM space uh, leftover RAM space that, you know, aside from our, our, our whole operating system for, for processing, right? So, I mean, if we have a, a one gigabyte worth of programs and things installed, then we're not going to be able to 
have a functional running operating system. Uh, so <clears throat> what we have is the opportunity to uh, install programs on a per use basis. So on boot would be for anything you need immediately. That's going to be drivers, firmware, um, just the base things that you need for your computer to really run and function on every install or if you're if or on every boot. And if you're you know only using it for something like a browser, you can have a browser in here too, but browsers are big. And if you wanted to use it for something else, um, maybe you want to record something or I don't know, whatever. There's a lot of different packages available. Um, then you might not want something like a browser every single time. Uh, so what we have the opportunity to do is we have something we can boot on demand. We can, um, we can, oh no, we can do it on boot. We can do it on demand. On demand is going to be so that you can choose to load it in at any time. Um, download and load is going to allow you to just immediately download something, load it in, but I don't think it backs it up for future use. So you'll have to re-download it again. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, separately, there's the just download only. So you can download it, uh, not load it into your RAM quite yet. And I don't believe that it's going to be there. I think it's going to be a temporary <clears throat> install and it's not going to be there again when you choose to uh, boot back into your system later. So here I am just kind of messing around in the apps program, um, showing you, you know, uh, you, with the basic things. So if you're, if, you're, if you're peeking around, you'll see um, that it has its peculiarities. If you want to, you know, install something, you got to click like go, right? I mean, this is not super intuitive, <clears throat> but it, again, this is beneficial. It's really helpful if we want to have a pared down system that functions specifically uh, every boot, right? So on boot, on manned, download and load, download only. Uh, and then if you have like an on-demand program or something, um, you can go back and actually like actively choose to load uh, an app locally, right? So you would go down to that load app locally instead of the browse. Oh, I guess, well, yeah, hang on, let me go for that real fast. So that's like, there's like the browse. <clears throat> if you uh, just go through search, you know, you'll be able to um, search for something by package name. Um, if you go to uh, where search is, um, then you can actually choose to ch search by tags, right? So tags are like um, keywords. So right now I've searched for Firefox, um, but if I want to search for like browsers, then oh shit, no, I think this is browser I had to search for. Yeah, this is a browser, then it gives me all those options. Whereas if I just search for browser in the search function, uh, it's only going to give me Chromium and I think Iridium. Yeah. So uh, don't use PS. Yeah, don't use the Chromium browser here. They, 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 it's from, it's like packaged from like 2010. It's not good. Uh, use Iridium. Use um, Firefox. Really, Firefox is the best one to use in this system because it is the you can get the latest and greatest at all moments. Um, and then, so there's a couple of different options in terms of, I think that there's like a possibility of installing the files like directly to your hard drive so that you can like use it like a regular program, you know, but that defeats the purpose of the speed of the boot to RAM option. So I, I don't really, I don't know how that works. I haven't played with any of that because uh, I don't really want to. It doesn't seem very useful. Um, I think we'll go over to the maintenance section. Yeah, okay, so um, in maintenance is where we can, uh, oh my God, what was I doing? You know, I, I did this all, uh, yeah, I got mentioned that already. What am I doing, what am I doing? Okay, so, oh, 
I'll just really start talking about maintenance. <laughs> so the, oh, okay, okay. So this is the load app locally thing I was talking about before. Um, do I click on it? Do I do I, do I, do I okay, well, whatever. So maybe I already passed the part. So this is the eh, come on, what was I freaking doing here? I have no idea what I was trying to what I was trying to show off here. Um okay, well so Maintenance, MD5 checking sums, that's that's what they, they use to keep uh to basically do your updates. Um so you you have your MD5s, and you can text your MD5s, uh make sure that you have MD5s for all your files, uh, all your programs, and then when it uh because MD5s change, then when you go to check for updates, then it'll it'll check your MD5 numbers against the numbers in the system in the database. And if they are not the same, then they will update you to the newest version. Um, then there's you know, possibility to check for like uh, orphaned dependencies and stuff like that. Um, but the dependencies and deletions is probably an important thing. If you want to delete something out of your system, just kind of delete the whole thing out. Uh, you can go in here um, and you can just give it a click oh, let's see what i choose uh well you know i don't want to delete anything but i'll just for sure i think i chose slurp and then i uh, marked it for deletion and there you go and i was like it's going to delete slurp and i guess grim uh as they are dependents well now no one has a dependency the other but i guess it wants to delete them both um and then you can mark them deletion and you can choose to unmark you know unmark it um there's a couple of other options in here that, again, I don't really run into a need for or a use for very often. I mean, there's a lot of, like, things that you can do that you don't necessarily need to do to make this, like, a sort of functional operating system. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so here we are. It's like, really, like, why would you need this anymore? Why would you need this in 2020? And the answer is probably you don't because... You don't need to run a compact Rosario anymore. It's just not valuable. Uh, it takes much power. It takes too much uh, energy. And I can get the same and faster experience from a Raspberry Pi, right? Uh, so why do we need TinyCore? And the answer is we really don't. It's kind of become a bit of a hobbyist system, ex with one exception, and that is the ARM architecture. Because now that we are in a world of the ARM uh, of, of, of the, the Raspberry Pi, you know, uh, we're on the fourth revision of that, and Raspberry Pi 1s and 2s aren't looking so great anymore. So what do we do with them? Well, TinyCore conveniently has an ARM version, and uh, I think that in the future, we want to keep making those ARM products work, uh, and you want to make the most of these very low power consumption, still reasonably powerful machines, then TinyCore is going to become a, a valuable tool. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of just showing off a little bit here and there. You know, just, just these are all the window managers you can use. There's plenty of options: Ice, Hackbox, FLWMs, the standard Fluxbox. They have Mutter. You can actually put GNOME. You can put GNOME. They have all the GNOME packages here, so you can install GNOME. Um, I personally. Uh, actually has Sway, and Sway's not even in, it doesn't show it, but they actually have Sway and a whole Wayland Weston uh, compositor implementation, uh, and it is decent. Um, I, I, uh, I will pop in a screenshot of my own Sway setup, but it works. It took, a, it took some, some finagling, and maybe I might do a short, uh, bit about that because you had to ch i had to change uh a an environment variable um that that's not very well um uh, it's not very really well documented i had to do a little bit of searching to find that one um but yeah so so there's a lot of options for window managers you're not stuck with this ugly window manager even though it is like a beautiful hybrid of mac os and uh windows xp but you know this is it's a it's a solid functional system and i mean it comes out of the gate with a nice little text editor uh and you know 
really that's about it. It comes with a text editor and the ability to download more programs as you need them. Uh, but I just wanted to show off that, you know, sorry, my typing is terrible here. Um, yeah, that you know, there there's a reason, there's a rhyme to this operating system, uh, and there's a method to its madness. Um, this really is about minimal consumption of RAM uh, and being able to, to have ultimate control over that RAM. Um, and so that you can you can make the, the best functional system. And, and, and it really teaches you a lot about, um, you know, how, how these systems work. It really is a fun kind of learning process in Linux, but things are also a little bit different too because they're not quite laid out the same. Uh, that some of the standard things you might expect because it's it doesn't come with GNU tools and even their GNU tools package is still a little bit like it feels like lacking. I feel like I'm I'm missing still some like core utilities that I would want to have. Um, and and it, the 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 functional structure of the um, the file system is a little bit different because it doesn't use your SSH the same way. Not SSH. It doesn't it doesn't use your config files the same way. It doesn't place things in your etc the same way. Um, it doesn't place things in, in a couple of different spots the same way. Um, so there are some differences, some things to, to get over, some hurdles to jump. But for the fun of, of trying to make an operating system work in the least amount of space possible uh, on old hardware that maybe has very little use uh, otherwise, uh, it's, it's, a really, it's, a fun, it's a fun system. It's a fun operating system, fun little or distribution. You know, it's a nice independent distribution. It's not backed by anybody else. It's just a cool group of people who wanted to make old computers run modern programs. And it does. It runs them pretty well. I mean, I'm not watching 720p video on it, but it functions. I can I can use it for typing for, you know, um, website browsing for like lighter websites or checking, you know, you know, whatever. Really, I can use it. Old, I, can install, I can install old programs. I mean, anything that you install to, like, your home or, um, I can't remember the other one. It's, it's, it's your, your home or, uh, oh, your opt, your opt folder. So your home or your opt folder are inherently persistent, and then there's a couple other persistence options you can choose. Uh, you can edit some different files, um, your on list file and stuff like this. And that's all documented. You should really, I mean, if you really want to learn more, you should check out the, the book that's available. It's a PDF book available on Tiny Core um, for the Tiny Core website. Um, and I'll link probably to that in the, in the links below uh, in the, you know, whatever. Um, and this is my first video. I just wanted to show off Tiny Core a little bit. I don't know. I enjoy this operating system. I just don't like to see it clowned on. <laughs> so this is this is it. This is this is the, the operating system of your dreams. Well, hopefully I'll see y'all maybe another time on Rad Linux.